Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hello everybody and welcome to the Command Valley. You're watching another episode of Duel of the Peaks. Today we have the Jumpstart Duel of the Peaks episode for you. Before we begin, I just wanted to remind you guys to please, if you enjoy this content, to click that subscribe button. And also another reminder that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Game Grid Lehigh. Joining me today for the play-by-plays is Peter. Hey guys. He will be going through each play and then I will be doing commentary if needed. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the points. And I will be introducing the challenges for today. So as always, three points if you win the game. Then uh, another recurring challenge is you get three points if you only cast your commander once during the game. You get those points as soon as you cast it for the first time, and then you'll lose them if you cast it again. The two point challenge for today goes to the player who is able to draw the most cards in a single turn. And then our one point challenge for today is to deal combat damage to Griffin because he is in the lead and uh, he needs it. And now Griffin will introduce the opening hands. Today, Peter will be playing Emil of the Blessed and his opening hand was Village Bellringer, Eerie Interlude, Elvish Visionary, Skull Clamp, Two Plains and a Forest. And Peter's personal challenge is to trigger five enter the battlefield triggers in one turn. Caleb will be piloting Naeth of the Dire Hunt and his opening hand was Heroic Intervention, a Gruel Signet, Chandra's Ignition, Gargos, Vicious Watcher, and Three Forests. And Caleb's challenge is to fight four times throughout the game to any creature from any player. Lannan will be piloting Bruvac the Grandiloquent, and his opening hand was Hedron Crab, Jace's Erasure, Deep Analysis, Fleet Swallower, and Three Islands. Lannan's personal challenge is to mill an opponent with a creature, an instant, a sorcery, and an enchantment. And last up, we have Griffin, who will be piloting Inez the Gale Force. His opening hand was stolen by the Fae, Favorable Winds, Counterspell, Dusk to Dawn, Island, Plains, and a Command Tower. And his personal challenge is to rotate a permanent, and his challenge is to rotate a non-land permanent all the way around the board. Keep in mind that these challenges are awarded two points upon completion. As the points stand right now, Griffin is in the lead with 35 points. 10 points behind is Peter with 25 points, then Landon with 17, and Caleb with 14. And with that, let's go to our turn one. Landon wins the flip, and he goes first. Landon draws, plays an island, taps it to play Hedron Crab. He passes this turn. Peter draws, he plays a forest for turn, then he taps it to play a skull clamp. And with that, he passes. Griffin draws, he plays a myriad landscape, comes in tapped, and he passes the turn. Caleb draws, he plays a forest, and passes back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, he plays an island, he drawn crab triggers, and Landon targets Griffin to mill three. Once you've started the mill train, the mill train doesn't stop until that player is milled out. The target is on my head. Landon then taps out to play Jace's Erasure, which will provide a little bit more mill targeted at Griffin. With that, he passes over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws. He plays a Plains. Then he taps out for Elvish Visionary. When Elvish Visionary enters, he draws a card. And currently, Peter is winning the two-point challenge for drawing two cards in a single turn. Griffin untaps and draws. He plays a Plains, and then he taps his two mana to cast Luminarch Ascension. Not that I didn't already have the target on my head. (laughs) After that, he passes. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays a forest, taps two for Gruel Signet, and then he passes and Luminarch Ascension gets a counter because Caleb did not do damage to Griffin. Moving on to turn three, Landon untaps and draws. Jace's Erasure triggers and he mills Griffin for one. Landon then plays an island and Hedron Crab triggers, milling Griffin for three. He then taps his three mana to cast his commander, Bruvac, and he gets his three points for casting his commander once. With nothing else, he passes, and Luminarch Ascension gets another counter. It's at two. Peter untaps and draws. He plays a Plains. Then he goes straight into combat. He swings Elvish Visionary at Griffin to deal him the one damage required to not get another counter on Luminarch Ascension. He also gets a point for dealing combat damage to Griffin. Congratulations. Thank you. He then pays two for Charming Prince, 
Charming Prince enters the battlefield and he chooses to exile Elvish Visionary until the next end step. Peter then goes to his end step, Elvish Visionary re-enters, and Peter draws another card. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He plays a command tower and then, with nothing else, passes the turn. Caleb untaps and draws and plays a rootbound crag, which enters untapped because he has a forest. He then taps out to cast Naeth, and he gets his three points for casting his commander. He passes with no swings at Griffin, and Luminarch Ascension gets a third counter. Lennon's turn, he untaps and draws, trigger on Jace's erasure, mills Griffin for two now that Bruvax out. He plays down an island and mills Griffin for six with that he drawn crab. Crab's doing work. Crab's doing work. Goes to combat, swings Bruvac at Griffin for one. Griffin takes one, goes down to 38, and Landon gets a point for dealing combat damage to Griffin. He then taps the rest of his mana to cast Deep Analysis. He draws two cards, which triggers Jace's Erasure again, and Griffin mills four cards. And now he has drawn three cards in his turn, so he is leading on the two-point challenge. Satisfied with his turn, he passes over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws. He plays down a forest, and then he taps all of his mana to cast Emil from the command zone, getting his three points. He goes to combat and swings Elvish Visionary and Charming Prince at Griffin for three damage. Griffin takes it. Peter goes to his end step. Griffin cracks his myriad landscape in response and gets two islands onto the battlefield tapped. Starting his turn, Griffin untaps and draws. He plays a Plains for turn. Then he taps four for the dusk half of Dusk to Dawn, destroying all creatures with power three or greater. Now this may seem like a weird time to cast a dust since there are only two creatures that are going to be hit with the dusk. However, my reasoning is I just wanted to get Naeth off of the battlefield so that Caleb could not swing at me so I could get the Luminarch Ascension online. Well said. It was a very smart move and it, it crippled my Emil as well before I had the chance to use it. So to very fair, well played. To be fair, I wasn't targeting you. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no one has any responses. Naeth and Emil are destroyed and returned back to the command zone, having done nothing at that point. So, satisfied, Griffin passes the turn, and Caleb begins. He untaps and draws. He plays down a game trail, revealing a force, so it comes in untapped. Then he taps out for Grothama. He then passes the turn, and Luminarch Ascension gets its fourth counter and is now online. Here we go, boys. Griffin can make those angels. Lennon starts his turn, goes to untap and draw, triggers at Jace's erasure, mills Griffin for two, of course, uh, then plays an island, mills Griffin for six with Hedron Crab. It really effective mill engine he's got right there, and his, <laughs> you're his only target. <laughs> I, I, when I first started the game, I was scared of a Traumatize or a Fleet Swallower that could just mill me in one turn, but honestly, this is also very scary. At this point, I felt like it was only a matter of turns before I was going to get milled out. Landon taps one island to cast Jace's Phantasm, and Griffin goes to count the cards in his graveyard because he's the one with all the cards. Can I count, please? please. One, two, three. Please. Oh, hold on. Let me Did you drop one? one? Stop. Okay. One, two, you three, have to three, four, two more five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, that's sick. sick. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank goodness I only have nine. Landon has no further actions. He passes at the turn. Peter starts his turn, he untaps and draws. He plays a Temple Garden coming in untapped and he'll take that two damage. Then he taps five for Cavalier of Dawn. As an enter the battlefield trigger, it destroys that Luminarch Ascension before Griffin has the chance to use it. That is extremely common for a Luminarch Ascension and I was looking forward to this happening to me. Griffin makes a 3-3 three, three Golem for his troubles. Not as good as a 4-4 four, four Angel, but... It'll do for now. It'll do for now. Satisfied, Peter passes the turn over to Griffin. Oh, satisfied, huh? Griffin starts, untaps, and draws. He plays an island. He then taps five to cast Dawn from Dust to Dawn from his graveyard, hoping to return all of the creatures with power two or less from his graveyard to the battlefield that Landon has been milling. Landon responds to that by tapping out to cast a countermand, which will counter Dawn and make Griffin mill eight cards with Bruvac out. Griffin responds by paying his last one to Path to Exile, targeting Bruvac to send him back to the command zone. This makes the mill only four, so it, it's not as costly. Lennon does forget to get the land from the Path to Exile, so it's essentially a free Path to Exile for me. Counterman then resolves, Don is countered and goes to Exile because that's how Aftermath works, and Griffin mills four cards. With nothing else, Griffin passes the turn over to Caleb. 
Caleb untaps and draws and plays a command tower. He then goes to combat and swings his Grothama at Griffin. Griffin blocks with the 3-3 Golem and takes no damage. Oh yeah, I'm not taking 10. He then taps out to cast Gargos Vicious Watcher and passes the turn. Turn 6, Lennon untaps and draws, triggering Jace's Erasure to mill Griffin for only one this time because Bruvac's not out. He then recasts Bruvac for 5, losing those 3 points for casting his commander again. After that, he plays an island to trigger the Hedron Crab and mill Griffin for 6, so that uh, that mill wasn't gone for long. All aboard the mill train, choo-choo. <laughs> choo-choo. <laughs> Lennon goes to combat, swings Jace's Phantasm at Peter for 5. No blocks, because Peter doesn't have flying. Peter takes 5. Lennon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays a planes. Let's go ahead and cut to the table to see the deal that I'm trying to make with Peter that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I'll make you a deal, Peter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> I can get Cavalier of Dawn back into your hand, and you can recast it. Or you could just bounce it for less. Or you can bounce it. But I can also do it while helping myself out at the same time. Now, I know that doesn't seem particularly of use to you, <laughs> but I'm in danger. Say I'm in no. danger. <laughs> <laughs> After that, Peter goes to combat, swinging Cavalier of Dawn and Charming Prince at Landon for six damage, and Elvish Visionary at Griffin for one. No blocks, they take the damage. Then he passes, holding up all of his mana. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He taps three for Ristic Study, and then he taps the other three to cast Hanged Executioner. Has an Enter the Battlefield trigger, he makes one Flying Spirit token, and... Passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays a forest and then just goes straight into combat. Swings both of his creatures at Griffin. Griffin blocks Grothama with a spirit. And then he takes eight from the Gargos. Caleb gets his point for dealing combat damage to Griffin. And everyone is satisfied with their one point. They hate me because they ain't me. He then pays three to cast Silvala, Heart of the Wilds. And he doesn't pay the Rhystic Study. Griffin draws a card. And with that, he passes over to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, triggering Drace's Erasure, Mill Griffin for two. Plays an island, triggering Hajon Crab, Mill Griffin for six. You know the drill. He then casts Deep Analysis for its flashback cost, losing three life and paying two mana. He doesn't pay the Rhystic Study, so Griffin draws a card. Then Landon draws two cards, Drace's Erasure triggers, and Griffin mills four. You may think that playing Rhystic Study while you're being milled out is not the best decision, but honestly, I'm on the ropes, and I'm just trying to find an answer to anything that can stop what's happening. Landon continues his turn by casting Psychic Corrosion. He then goes to combat. Peter responds to his combat step by casting Village Bellringer, which Griffin will get a card from with Rhystic Study, and when it enters the battlefield, he'll untap all of his creatures. Peter then taps the rest of his mana to cast Eerie Interlude. He targets all of his creatures. He's hoping to get four more Enter the Battlefield triggers right here so that he can get the, the his personal challenge of getting five Enter the Battlefield triggers in one turn. Griffin draws a card from Rhystic Study, and Landon responds to the Eerie Interlude by casting Rapid Hybridization, targeting Cavalier of Dawn. Griffin gets another Rhystic Study card. Rapid Hybridization resolves, Cavalier dies, and he makes a 3-3 Frog Lizard. Eerie Interlude then resolves, and the rest of his creatures get exiled until the end of Landon's turn. Landon has no further actions, so he passes. Peter's creatures all return at the end of his turn, and Peter stacks the triggers. First, Charming Princes enter the battlefield triggers. He scries two and bottoms both of them. Then... Elvish Visionary triggers, and he draws a card, and then Village Bell Ringer triggers, but literally does nothing. After all that, Peter starts his turn. He untaps and draws. He plays a Forest. He then pays one for Lanawar Elves, Griffin getting another card. He then taps two for Arcane Signet, and Griffin gets another card. Satisfied, he passes his turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and he plays a Tranquil Cove, gaining a life. He taps one to cast Soul Ring. And then he taps five to cast Cleansing Nova, choosing the mode to destroy all creatures. Caleb responds to that with Heroic Intervention. He doesn't pay the Rhystic Study trigger, so Griffin draws a card. And Griffin responds to the Heroic Intervention by casting Counterspell, countering the Intervention. No response. Intervention is countered. 
Cleansing Nova resolves and all of the creatures die. There's no way I'm going to destroy all creatures, leaving myself open to a Grothama and a Gargos. Griffin then passes, goes to discard, and discards a Mystic Remora. Feels bad, but I don't need to be drawing more cards. Caleb untaps and draws, and he seems upset about the card that he drew. I can't imagine why. He then taps six to recast Naeth, losing those three points for recasting his commander. And with nothing else, passes the turn. Landon untaps and draws. Trigger on Jace's Erasure, Griffin mills one. And another trigger on Psychic Corrosion, each opponent mills two. He plays an island. No, he draws a crab this time. Thank so- goodness. <laughs> Then he taps seven to cast Fleet Swallower. Okay, maybe now I want the Hedron Crab back. <laughs> he pays for the Rhystic Study, so Griffin doesn't get another card. And then he passes the turn over to Peter. Peter responds to the end step by casting Secure the Waste, X equal to four. So Griffin will draw a card from the Rhystic Study, and Peter will create four 1-1 one, one warrior tokens. Peter, with his new tokens, untaps and draws. He equips the Skull Clamp individually to each of his creatures, paying one each time, and draws eight cards as a result and and as each of the creatures die. This will put him in the lead on the two-point challenge. He's drawn nine cards this turn. He then plays a Plains for turn, and then he pays five for Cather's Crusade. Peter then passes the turn. Griffin untaps and draws. He plays an Island, and then he taps all of his mana to cast Stolen by the Fey, X equal to seven. He targets Fleet Swallower to return it to Landon's hand, and then he creates seven blue fairy tokens with flying. Seems like a reasonably good exchange. Griffin then passes, going to discard, and he discards a planes. Caleb goes to untap and draw. He then taps five for Xanagos, God of Revels. Not paying Rhystic Study, Griffin draws another card. He goes to combat, Naeth triggers, and he pays the three to make Naeth a 6-3 that must be blocked this turn. Then Xenagos triggers. Naeth then becomes a 12-9. And then he swings Naeth at Griffin, and it must be blocked. Griffin blocks with a fairy. Naeth triggers, and Caleb draws a card. Satisfied, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws. Trigger on Jace's erasure. Griffin mills one. Trigger on psychic corrosion. Each of his opponents mill two. He then pays three for Jace's Archivist, not paying for Rhystic Study, and then pays the rest of his mana for Aether Gale, not paying for Rhystic Study again. He bounces the Rhystic Study, Soul Ring, and three of Griffin's Fairies, as well as Peter's Skull Clamp, back to their hands. Tapped out, he passes the turn. Peter goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He then taps out to cast Martial Coup, X equal to seven. So he destroys all other creatures, he creates seven 1-1 one, one soldiers, and then Cather's Crusade will trigger seven times, each soldier getting seven plus one plus one counters. Those are some big soldier tokens. And with that, Peter will get his personal challenge of getting five or more ETB triggers in one turn. See, this is where if you Aether Gale, you bounce the Cather's Crusade on the table. Lesson learned, kiddos. With all of those tokens on the battlefield, Peter passes the turn. Griffin untaps and draws. He plays an island. He recasts his soul ring. He then pays three for Midnight Haunting, making two spirit tokens. He then pays five for Inez, getting his three points finally for casting his commander. He then pays the rest of his mana to cast Favorable Winds, giving all of his flying creatures a buff. That was literally it. I feel like at this point, there was not much that I could do to escape from the threat that was Landon in the milling. And the Cathar's Crusade tokens, so I just need some points. And blockers. Indeed. Griffin passes his turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays a forest, and then he taps five for Disrupt Decorum. Griffin is then going to put a deal on the stack. I'd like to put a deal on the stack. (laughs) Okay. Or that resolves. All right, I'll let you do that. Um, I am in desperate need. Of, wait, actually, I'm at 27. You've got seven seven sevens. 58 eight eights. Eight eights. I can block. Yeah, I'm dead. So. <laughs> Either of us. Uh, him or okay. I. Um, we're dead. It's fine. One of you. It's fine. One of you. Okay. I, I, I will rest my fate. Go ahead. For those of you who wanted to know what I had in my hand, I had 
fierce guardianship in my hand, and I was curious if I could counter that disrupt decorum that those tokens would not come at me, but I, in the end, I just forgot about it because re I reasoned, I could reasonably assume that the tokens were going to come at me anyway. With no further actions, Caleb passes the turn. Landon untaps and draws. Jace's erasure triggers. Griffin mills one. Psychic corrosion triggers. Each opponent mills two. And it's worth noting at this point that Griffin has five cards in his deck. So this made me think maybe the tokens aren't going to come at me because I only have five cards left in my library. I'm going to die anyway. Landon holds up all of his mana and passes the turn. Peter untaps and draws. Peter plays a Temple of Plenty, scrying the top card to the bottom of his library. He then pays four for Anointed Procession, and then he taps the rest of his mana to cast Tristani Discordance. This triggers Cather's Crusade. He puts a plus one, plus one counter on each of his creatures. Tristani then triggers on entering and makes four soldiers with lifelink. And each of those soldiers triggers Cather's Crusade again, putting four more plus one, plus one counters on each creature. Peter goes to combat, and Griffin has something to say. Peter, before you do this, I just wanted to remind you of our friendship. <laughs> I don't know Everything, why, I don't stop know it, Brandon. This is a tender it. moment. No, it's not. Everything that you and I have been through together, Peter, in this game specifically, not much, but <laughs> what it was. It wasn't beautiful. I think, Landon, please. All those small, tender moments, it was worth it for me. I'm still swinging a bunch of you. <laughs> <laughs> I was imagining at this moment, um, the Titanic music going on in the background. That was my image, and I was hoping you would like feel that, like you were gonna vibe with that. <laughs> I, you know what? I might have felt the same thing, you know. But I, I. It turns out you're just a heartless monster. I, I guess. <laughs> Peter then swings five of his fourteen, fourteen soldiers at Griffin, and two of them at Landon. Please stay tuned because I will be looking out for some new best friends. Nobody blocks. Griffin will go down to zero life, and he's out of the game. And Landon will go down to three. Rip in peace, Griffin. Rip in peace. Honestly, this is just the fate of Duel of Peaks. If you are ahead, and I've been ahead for a couple episodes now, this is all to be expected. I am dominating as far as points go. I expected this game was going to be very much an arch enemy game. That's totally fine. I had fun playing this deck, and I hope everybody else is having fun playing their decks, except for Peter, because he's backstabbing... Unicorn. Unicorn. <laughs> he's a front-stabbing unicorn. So Landon has all of his mana untapped, and he did have something that he could have done to save both me and him from all of this damage, but he felt like me being out of the game was safer, even though he went down to three life. Peter, having reduced the population of the playing table from four to three, passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb responds to Peter's end step by casting Crusen Grip, blowing up the Cathar's Crusade once and for all. About dang time. Caleb untaps and draws. I was really hoping that I would draw something to be able to deal with this, so now I need you to deal with it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Caleb then spends his entire turn recasting Naeth for eight mana. He goes to combat, but he elects not to swing at Landon with his doubled up Naeth and passes. Landon goes to his turn, untaps and draws. Jace's erasure triggers, and Peter is his new target for mill. Peter mills one. And then psychic corrosion triggers. Peter and Caleb will both mill two. He then plays the disc for four mana. Bum, bum, bum. Nevin Rawls disc. Big threat on the board to Peter's board at the very least. I bet it kind of feel bad to be Landon spending the whole game milling out one opponent for that opponent to have five cards left in their library and to die from some other opponent dealing damage. Yeah, yeah, I think that was the sentiment that everybody had on the table. Like, oh, he was so close. He should have just let me die to that. He should have just... I wanted to die to that. I, I, It was the right way to go, but I also felt like if you had another turn, then you could have done some crazy stuff because Inaz was still up. I could have done some stuff, but I wasn't going to win. No, no, of course not. After playing the disc, Landon passes his turn. Peter untaps and draws. He plays a fortified village. Revealing? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Fortified village comes in tapped. He goes to combat. He swings f five of his big tokens at Caleb and two of them at Landon. Landon has no choice at this point. He responds by casting Aether Spouts before damage is dealt. 
Aether Spouts resolves and each attacking creature gets put on the top or bottom of Peter's library. Doesn't really matter because they're tokens. Peter then pays three to cast Ashnod's Altar. He pays three more to cast Good Fortune Unicorn. And he pays one more to recast that Skull Clamp. With lots of targets on the board for the disc to destroy, Peter passes the turn. What? Yeah, why the heck did you do that? Honestly. You saw Nev disc and casted your hand. Honestly, like... In hindsight, that was a stupid decision. It was, it was absolutely, I should not have done that. But at the same time, I did not have any other token makers in my hand. And if they were going to go with the disc, then those token synergistic cards, the Astronaut's Altar, Skull Clamp, they were going to be worthless anyways. So in hindsight, it wasn't that costly of a, of a mistake to play all those cards. But at the same time, I probably should have just kept them in my hand. I think so. Yeah. Caleb starts his turn. He untaps and draws. And he's deliberating what he's going to do on his turn. Early in the game, Landon and Caleb were talking about making some sort of alliance where Caleb would not kill Landon. And Landon would not mill Caleb out if he drew one of his cards that can just mill an entire library with Ruvek out. So now, Caleb is deliberating because he's sitting on some cards that can do a lot of work, but it will kill Landon in the process. So there's a lot of politicking, a lot of decision making going on between these two players. And I'm a man of my word. I'm just wondering. If Except. I should be a man of my word. <laughs> but. but. I, have, I have to be a man of my word. Fast so shoes. I'm gonna play some fast shoes. So deciding not to use whatever he has in his hand that will kill Landon. He pays two for Swiftfoot Boots and attaches them to Naeth for one. He then goes to combat. Naeth triggers first. He doubles Naeth's power by paying three mana. And then he doubles her again with Xanagos' triggered ability. And then he swings Naeth at Peter for 12. Peter blocks with the soldier because he has to block. Caleb draws a card. Why is everybody casting their stuff with a Nev's disc that's going to be blown up on the next turn? <laughs> Caleb then plays his land for turn, Cinderglade, and passes. Moving on to turn 12, Landon untaps and draws, has a trigger on Jace's Erasure, Peter mills one, and then each of his opponents mill two with the Psychic Corrosion. And then he decides not to blow everything up this turn, and just passes. Peter goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He taps eight of his mana for Creator Hoof Behemoth. Creator Hoof enters with a plus one, plus one counter because of Good Fortune Unicorn, and each creature will get plus six, plus six, and trample from his Enter the Battlefield ability. Peter then goes immediately into combat, swings Crater Hoof at Landon, and then swings the rest at Caleb. In response to this, Landon pops the disc. Peter responds to the popping by casting Ghost Way. He blinks each non-token creature he controls. He doesn't worry about the, the tokens because they're just going to die from that disc anyways. And all of the rest of his creatures are going to come back at the end of the turn. The disc then resolves, everything else is destroyed, all of his tokens, enchantments, artifacts, everything. Xenagos will stay on the board since he is an indestructible enchantment. Peter then passes the turn and his creatures return and he stacks the triggers like this. Tristani makes two 1-1 one, one soldiers with lifelink and then each creature other than Good Fortune Unicorn enters with a plus one plus one counter and then Crater Puff pumps everything but nobody cares. I cared. I always cared. But you didn't exist. I didn't. I don't exist. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He uh, he thinks it's okay to kill Landon now. Probably because of the disc. Probably because of the disc. Yeah. He taps four to cast Questing Beast. And then he taps the rest of his mana to cast Chandra's Ignition, which must have been what would have killed him earlier. He just decided not to do that. He targets Questing Beast with Chandra's Ignition. No one has any responses and... Lannan and Peter both take four damage, as well as all of Peter's creatures. Since Questing Beast has Death Touch, all of his creatures will die, and at this time, Landon is out of the game. Rip in peace, Landon. Rip in peace. Your deck was definitely my favorite. Even though it was targeting me, it was pretty stinking awesome. I'm sorry that you didn't get to mill somebody out during this game. Yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun to see the mill in action. Eventually, it was affecting all of us, and I saw some pretty good cards go into my graveyard for sure. Um, Me too. All of them. Caleb then goes to combat. He doubles Questing Beast's power and toughness with Xanagos, and he swings at Peter for eight. Peter takes eight, going down to 26. Caleb ships the turn over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, and he pays four for Sky Shroud Claim. He gets two forests on the battlefield untapped, 
and then he pays four for smothering tithe. Maybe you're a professional bluffer. You have tricks up your sleeves, you just don't want to reveal them yet. It's also worth noting that I have no cards in hand at this point. So the tricks must be very hidden. Yes, yes. Hidden at the top of my deck, even. Maybe. <laughs> Wait and see. Peter has no further actions, and he passes the turn. Caleb untaps and draws, and he doesn't pay for that smothering tithe, so Peter gets a treasure. Dangerous. Caleb then casts Hornet Queen for seven. He creates four insects with flying and death touch. And Xenagos is a creature now. He's online. Caleb goes to combat. He doubles Questing Beast's power again with the Xenagos. He swings Questing Beast and Xenagos at Peter. And Peter takes 14, going down to 12. Looks like he's on his last ropes here. Hind legs. If he doesn't draw something real good here, it's probably it. Caleb passes the turn. Peter goes, untaps, draws, and plays down. A Selesnya Guildgate. Tapped. Let's have a moment of silence for Peter. Okay. Peter passes the turn. Caleb is uh, glowing with happiness. Ecstatic. <laughs> He's ecstatic right now. Absolutely thrilled. He untaps. He draws. He goes straight into combat. He doubles Questing Beast's power with Xenagos and swings out to finish Peter off. Oh, yeah! Yeah! Congratulations, Caleb. That is your first game of Duel of Peaks that you have won. And, you know, fate just rested right in your hands at that last couple of turns to just let you go ahead and do what Aggro wants to do and just swing out with some big, powerful creatures. Rip in peace, Peter. You definitely had the strongest board multiple times. In fact, I'd probably say you had the strongest board majority of the game. And it's definitely sad to see that you couldn't, you couldn't pull something off the top to help you get out of that sticky spot. But... I will, uh, I will award you the VIP of the game. Thank you, man. Thank you. I Yeah, I felt like it, that was a pretty good game. The the real, the thing that gave me the advantage was that turn that I skull clamped all of those tokens. I got eight cards off the top with, the, with those four tokens for four mana. And in those cards, I found my Ashnod's Altar. I found Tristani. I found all of my token makers everything else that I needed to uh, to set up the, that fantastic board at the end of the game. Heck yeah. Um, so the two MVP cards of the day are going to be Skull Clamp and Cather's Crusade. Yeah, Cather's Crusade was really a bomb there that time. That was just, that was so good. Yeah, I felt, at that last, that last couple of turns, I feel like if I would have played my cards a little bit differently, maybe it would have gone differently, but I was really just trying to hold on to those three points for, for only casting Emil once. I didn't even get to use Emil that entire game. Emil came out and then immediately died, and we never saw any of those blink shenanigans, but I, I had those redundant things like Eerie Interlude and Ghostway. I had, I had Charming Prince that I could have used to bounce things as well. Uh, that's what it, that's exactly the kind of things that those cards are in the deck for is to add some redundancy to the commander's strategy so i never felt like i was lacking there i felt like the deck was pretty strong even without casting the commander and with that caleb wins the game awarding him three points for winning the game let's go ahead and move to our point count we'll start with caleb he gained one point for damaging griffin and he got three points for winning the game so he gets a grand total of four points for this game, bringing him up to 18 points. Landon, the only point he got was for damaging Griffin, so he gets one point, and he also goes up to 18. Landon and Caleb are tied at this point. Peter is the next in line, and he got everything but the points for winning. He got one point for dealing damage to Griffin, he got two points for the drawing cards in one turn challenge. He drew nine cards in that single turn, and, and he held on to that the entire game. He only cast his commander once, so that's three points. And he got his personal challenge for getting five ETB triggers in one turn, so that's a total of eight points for this game. And then Griffin, our leader, gets three points for only casting his commander once, and that's it. So he is now at 38 points for the season. So at the end of this game, our standings are Caleb and Landon are in third place, tied for third, with 18 points. Peter is in second with 33 points, coming up quite a lot from that point gain. And Griffin is at 38 points, still in the lead from his massive point gains in previous games. So it's just you and me now, basically, Peter. Yeah, that's what it seems like. But I mean, 
we're just barely over halfway through the season. Anything could happen at this point. We could have a massive turnaround from, from those other guys. I look forward to the next game when my three opponents will once again try to challenge my awesomeness and my power, and once again fail to do so. I would really hope that everyone would recognize me as a threat too, at this point. I'm five points away from you. I recognize you as a threat, and I can see in future games where it's just going to be me targeting you because nobody else really matters. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can see the dynamic already, and I'm really excited to see the last five games of the season. And I hope you guys are too. And with that, that is the end of the episode. We hope you guys enjoyed this game. If you liked it, please like this video and subscribe. Let us know in the comments what you thought was the most important play and which decks you enjoyed the most. Every single deck that it was shown today, there is a deck tech on our YouTube channel, so we will link those in the description below for you guys to go watch. Once again, this episode is brought to you by Game Grid Lehigh, so please check them out if you're in the Utah County area. And with that, we will see you guys in our next game of Commander. And not to spoil anything, but we're going home, brew. Thanks for watching, guys. See you guys.